All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The uh, pardon board is reconvening. We're at Louisiana State Penitentiary. Today is Monday, October 24th, 2022. It's 11.39 a.m. With the staff at Angola, please introduce yourself for the record. Deputy Warden Tracy Falgood, Regional Admiral Classification. Carmen Shipley, Offender Records. Katie Sergeant Transition Specialist. And everybody? That's yes, ma'am. Thank you. So we have we have quite a few folks who are here in the room with us today, and I think everybody's finally got comfortable. Um, but first, let me ask you, Mr. Larry, to introduce yourself. Tell us your name and your DOC number. My name is Larry Halls, DOC number 341495. Yes, sir. And you are represented by counsel this morning. Mr. Hamilton, will you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Bruce Hamilton, um, and I'm representing Mr. Halls. So we have a here in support, uh, Mr. Uh, James Pritchford. We have uh, the Parole Project has joined us by phone or by Zoom. Julia Mudd, uh, Gus May, also um, by Zoom. Your uncle, Robert Fry, uh, Jay Jackson. Jan Halls, Edward Ward, Karen Ward, Randy Halls, and Angela Noah. Um, we also have here in opposition, Brett Parson, Mark Erty, Amanda Erty, Cindy Erty, Tamika White from the DA's office, and Matthew Belzer also from the DA's office. Um, first, Mr. Halls, I'll just read some identifying information into the record. After which I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Bonnie Jackson, seated to my far left. Your case has been assigned to her, so she'll take the lead on the interview. Then we'll hear from everybody who's indicated they want to speak. You'll be allowed to make a statement at the end before we turn it over to Mr. Hamilton for his presentation and close it out. Okay? Mr. Halls, you understand all that? Yes, yes, ma'am. I sure do. Thank you. So uh, you are Larry D. Halls. Your DOC number is 341495. You're seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Tangible Hill of Parish in October 1994 for a second degree murder conviction, and you received a life sentence. Mr. Halls, is that correct information? That is correct. Okay. Mrs. Jackson? Good morning, Mr. Halls. It is still morning. My name is Bonnie Jackson. Uh, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll start the questioning for the board. Mr. Halls, how old are you? 65. And how long have you served uh, on this charge? I think later this week will have been 30 years from my arrest date. And so you were approximately 25 years old at the time this crime was committed. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure I heard you correctly. I thought you said 25. I was 35. I'm sorry. Um, you're, you're correct. I misspoke. Uh, so the victim in this case uh, was your ex-wife. Is that correct? That's correct. How long had the two of you been married before your divorce? Uh, it was a very brief time. I think it maybe a year. We were together okay. about six months, and then it, we had a six-month separation before the divorce was final. And how long had you been divorced at the time of her murder? Five years, approximately, yeah. Five years. So it's been a long time. Is that correct? That's correct. And you and the victim had a son together? <laughs> yes, we did. And that son was born with cerebral palsy. Is that correct? That is correct, ma'am. And as a consequence of that, he was paralyzed. Is that correct? Yes, paralyzed wouldn't be the correct term. He was a quadriplegic. So he had uh, limited function of both of his uh, arms and legs. And how old was he at the time of his mother's death? 
he was six. And who was the primary caretaker for him? She was. Miss Ann was her, his mother. All right. And after her death, uh, who assumed the care for your son? Uh, Gregory's grandmother, Shirley Erty, Ann's mother. And Gregory has since passed away. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. When did he pass away? Uh, in 2018. And how old was he at the time of his death? I believe he was 32. And so for uh, over 20 years of his life, uh, his grandparents uh, had to care for him. Uh, it is my understanding that they were the caregivers after uh, Anne's passing. Well, let's let's talk about Anne's passing. All right. Anne was murdered. Is that correct? You're breaking in and out just a little bit. Could you repeat that? Uh, you refer to it as her passing but she was actually murdered. Yes, I, yes, ma'am, I'm responsible for her death. I, I, so I'm murdered. Tell us uh, the circumstances surrounding this crime. Why uh, did you kill your ex-wife and how? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry you're breaking out a little bit. I didn't know you'd finished, but I'm I understood. Sorry, the I, first, I'd like to hear a little bit about the circumstances of the offense, uh, how you killed her, and more importantly, why did you kill her? Um, all right. Um, Anne and I had had somewhat of a contentious relationship. 90% of it revolved around medical bills and insurance forms and taking care of our son. And stop talking right there. Why was that contentious? Well, I, I, will, explain, I will explain right now a little bit. Um, for example, there's a, un, uh, a wheelchair lift that was uh, involved. We had a court hearing date, a monitoring date. We went to it and a bill for approximately $7,000 came up for a wheelchair lift, which I was responsible for. So the judge set up a future hearing date. And to pay this bill, I simply had to turn it into my insurance and I would have paid the residual, but I needed the invoice and uh, uh, from the doctor, a, a prescription from the doctor, et cetera. And at the conclusion of that hearing date, Ann and I got together and she was supposed to give me the paperwork. Well, a month drug by and I'd ask about it and then I never got anything a little bit longer. Uh, I'd ask again and I didn't get it and we were getting close to the hearing date. And this was kind of typical of our relationship and it all revolved around, or not all, but 90% of it revolved around insurance and paying bills for my son's health care, which I was responsible for. So as this hearing day grew near, I was getting very upset about the situation of always arising and going to court with unpaid bills. So I had went to her beauty shop that day to discuss this with her and that I needed the paperwork. And what's more, this had been an ongoing, continual uh, piece of problem between she and I. Excuse me, I'm a little bit nervous, as you can imagine. And so I went there to speak to her. My idea was to catch her when she was getting off of work so we could have a little bit of privacy at her shop where we could discuss this. So when she came out of the shop, I talked to her, confronted her in the parking lot and said, look, we need to discuss these medical bills. I need the paperwork, the insurance, and or excuse me, the invoice and the doctor's prescription that we've been talking about for the last two months. She stated that she had to go pick up Gregory. So I said, look, Ann, I've waited 
a couple of hours to talk to you. Now we're going to have to get this straightened out today. I'm not going to wait any longer. We got a court monitoring date coming up. So she said, jump in the truck and or her van, excuse me. And we can talk on the way to pick up Gregory. She had to pick him up from the babysitter. So we left. From the minute we started talking, it was an argument. And uh, eventually the argument turned into a fiercer argument and it became stopped. We were stopped at a stop sign and she just basically stood there or sat there in the seat and we were just arguing sitting there at the stop sign. And the argument eventually become physical and I shot. Uh, let's, stop right, let's stop right there. What do you mean it became physical? Well, she kind of turned in the seat and I brought up a couple of issues and she was very upset, which is typically what happened whenever we tried to have a conversation about this. And I guess she tried slapping me. I don't guess she did try slapping me, but it wasn't nothing. It wasn't nothing that, that was harmful to me or was going to hurt me. I just really lost my temper. And uh, I'm sorry for the actions that I took. I wish I would have never done it. I thought, I thought, what actions did you take? I just grabbed her arm. I tried just grabbing her arms and I got slapped again and I just lost control, I guess. Is the best explanation I can give for. And just you, a long series of aggravations. Well, you keep saying you lost your self-control but you're not telling me what you did. Well, like I was suggesting, we were just having type of a struggle between us. I grabbed her arm, her hand, and, um, you know, she had slapped me again. And I, I don't know. I just, I had never really done that before. I'd never really lost control with her. It just, this isn't the first time we've had the same type of scenario and I'd always remain calm. And I just, I guess I was to the point where something had to change and I just, I didn't, well, I didn't really how, know what else to do. I, how did she get ligature marks around her neck? Well, I've done a lot of things that day that I'm not very proud of. I'm actually ashamed of, and uh, I would like to say that I'm sorry. And I apologize to the Erty family for what I did and the grief I've caused them. How did, she get, listen. Mark, sir, how did she get ligature marks around her neck? After I shot her, uh, after I shot her, her foot fell off the brake and the van started rolling forward. I just slammed the gear shift into park. So it wouldn't run in the ditch. I had no idea that, that she did, that she was going to die really. And we was going down borderline road and I was heading towards the hospital. And at what, 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 at what point did you think she wasn't going to die? She was shot in the forehead between the eyes. I had no idea that she was shot in the forehead. Uh, it was a complete surprise to me when I saw the picture when I was in the parish jail and the district attorney brought us the picture. It was the first thing I asked my attorney. I, 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 could, I couldn't believe it, but anyway, I thought she was shot in the stomach or the chest. And I headed down Wardline Road and she said, please help me. I said, Ann, I'm taking you to the hospital as fast as I can. And I didn't get down okay. Wardline Road. She asked for uh, uh, I'm going to stop you there for a moment. All right. All right. No one shot in the chest or the face between the eyes. I'm talking or asking you anything. It didn't happen that way. Why did you have a gun? Why did you have a gun and how and when did you acquire the weapon? The reason I had the gun was I had a restaurant and a bar in Ponchatoula and I've been broken into a couple of times and I carried money in and out morning and evening. And, uh, you know, I just thought it was in my best interest at that time, you know, to acquire a gun. 
and the people who were the vendors in one of the vendors in my restaurant we got into a discussion and and he had a gun and he said that i could use his till i got my own this was i don't know a couple of months before this incident happened i and that's why i had the gun why did you have it on you during your uh, interaction uh, with your ex-wife? Why did you have it on your person as opposed to in your vehicle, in your business? Why were you armed with it when you had uh, your interaction with your wife, ex-wife? Well, it was a it was a very small 25 caliber pistol, and I usually just stuck it in my back pocket in front of my billfold and carried it with me. Um, and I really done it so much, I just carried it with me almost 24 hours a day. Except when I was in my business, I would put it in my office, and I never really thought about it. But I just had it with. Me. Whose vehicle were you in when uh, Anne was killed? Excuse me, say that. Whose vehicle were you all in when she was shot and killed? Uh, the vehicle, I guess you could say, was Ann's. I paid for it, but, uh, but it was she, for, for Gregory. Right, but she had the vehicle. It was not your vehicle. Correct, she, correct. On a day to day basis, she had the vehicle. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, after you shot her, and again, you never explained how she got ligature marks around her neck, but it's okay. I'm not going to go into that anymore. But after you shot her, what happened next? Okay, well, that's where I was going. We was going down Wardline Road after I shot her, and she asked me, she, she said, please help me. And I said, I'm taking you. Hey, we have a. Uh, we lost our connection. Connection lost. So I'll forward it for you guys. By the way, after this, I, I have the full um, docket on what actually, on all the details of what happened with this case. So afterwards, I'm going to. I'll share the link in the description, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Thank you. It's um, it actually goes to six. Okay, I think he's back. Here we go. I don't know why the parole project is taking on this case. That's another thing. Usually they take on like really strong cases and this just doesn't, this just doesn't feel right at all. No, it's, it's actually, I think it's, all right. Uh, see y'all are back. Can y'all hear us? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you, but you're okay. your laptop now, Miss Renatsi. So we're you're not on the big screen. Oh, oh well, that's probably better for us. Um, just stand by a minute. We're, we had some folks that left the room. We're going to bring them back in, and then we'll get started or resume. <laughs> Thank y'all for working through that and for everybody's patience. So, uh, Mr. Hulls, we're ready to, to resume where we left off, Mrs. Jackson. All right. All right. Um, Mr. Hulls, could you just tell us after the, the, the homicide, what does he do then? Uh, do you enlist some people to help you after you um, killed your ex-wife? So tell us a little bit about that. What happened? Uh, immediately after it happened, um, you know, I I really just didn't know what to do. I, I rode around in a, just a little bit, kind of heading towards Ponchatoula, and uh, I came up with the idea, no matter how foolish it was, that I would just uh, see if I could get bike to take the van to New Orleans. Uh, bike was a, a a friend of mine. He did maintenance work around my building and different things. And we have been known each other for quite a while and had been friends. And I stopped at his house and I 
asked him, uh, I told him I needed to talk to him. When he come out to the van, I told him what I did. And uh, we got in the van and he said he would help me. We rode around for a few minutes and I explained to him what I wanted him to do. And he said he would do it, but he wasn't, he wouldn't drive the van to New Orleans with the, with the body in the, in the van. So we put her van, her body out in a, a little wooded area right there, outside of Ponchatoula along the interstate somewhere. We was just riding around out in the country. I didn't even really know where we was at. And uh, he took the van to New Orleans and two days later we went back and buried the body. Was there a female also um, involved in, um, we'll call it cover up? I didn't hear the last little bit you, you said there, but you asked if there was a female. There was two, two women that were involved. One was my girlfriend, and uh, the other was a lady that worked at my restaurant. And I just asked them to basically give me an alibi, and they did. And while we're here, I would like to say that I don't know if they're listening or whatever, but I apologize for, for bringing them into this. They didn't do anything other than just try to be a friend to me. And uh, I, I put them in a very bad situation and caused them and their family a lot of grief. And I'm sorry for that. Well, well let's talk about the last 30 years, uh, Mr. Hobbs. Um, tell us how you spent the last 30 years. Or what if, uh, I see that you have taken a lot of uh, NCCER courses, HVAC, electrical. I show that you have uh, been the electrician uh, at Hunt. You've been a re-entry mentor. You've also completed 100 hours of pre-release. What other programs uh, have you been involved in, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hall, since your incarceration? Other than what you mentioned, uh, mentioned most of it has been religious uh, religious programs. I took the diaconate, diaconate classes for the Catholic Church. And uh, it's basically what if you was on the street that you would take if you were going to become a, a deacon for the Catholic Church. It's kind of like the beginning part of that. And uh, I graduated from the NOBTS ministry with a bachelor's degree in 2005. And okay, 2005. I, th I think so. It's been quite a while ago now, but I think I, we graduated in 2005. I finished the course in about 2004, and uh, I've been served as a Catholic peer minister here at Angola and while I was at Hunts. Okay. Um, are you in the involved in any clubs or uh, organizations within the prison besides Reentry. Uh, I'm a member of DC, Dale Carnegie, and uh, we do various things like Christmas uh, program for the people in the TU, uh, which is a treatment unit for, uh, I guess these are uh, mentally uh, challenged people and uh, do various other things in the prison. And a point lookout committee, I've participated in that when I've been at Angola since probably 2004 and still do today. And uh, what exactly do you do with Point Lookout? Um, inmates that pass away here at Angola and uh, does, do not have uh, either means or family to claim the body and take care of them, we provide a, a religious service and a burial at Point Lookout and in a very dignified what, manner. And what, what's your role in that process? Generally, I am uh, just a pallbearer. Sometimes I'm uh, just general support, but I've been recently asked to conduct the services uh, at Point Lookout. So you've never conducted services before? You, you just uh, no, served a pallbearer and, and what else? No, I never have. Uh, uh, I've been available, but there's generally been several people that have taken on that role and really pretty good at it. And uh, right now it's kind of short staffed because of the COVID thing. It's limited people that go. So I was asked to uh, perform some services in the future if 
if I was available, and I said I would. Um, as I looked at your programs, uh, Mr. Halls, the thing that struck me most, and, and I'm not going to discount your um, your um, religious participation, uh, but most of your pro programs have been geared towards vocational trades, uh, age that. Uh, electrical, uh, electrical uh, certifications, but I haven't seen a whole lot of programs that address the person. You know, I, I, I haven't seen programs that are designed for self-reflection. Can you tell us why you've not taken uh, those kinds of programs? Um, I'd say those programs have got really popular in the, uh, the last 10 years and provided pretty extensively here at Angola and both at Hunts when I was there. When I was at Hunts, I facilitated the programs. So uh, I was what, what programs did you facilitate? Uh, they were mostly religious, but they were self-help programs, uh, probably on <laughs> online with Thinking for a Change and uh, uh, listen to me, listen to me. Uh, you know, generally, people who have done thinking for a change, for instance, would have a certificate of completion for that program. And I didn't see that in your file. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of, again, those kinds of programs that get to you as an individual as opposed to you as an electrician or, or, or air conditioning repair person. While those are useful tools, if you are successful, they really don't address what it was that would cause someone to shoot his ex-wife between the eyes, knowing that he had a six-year-old helpless child, totally dependent on his mom, and yet you are able to do that. And I don't see anything in your submittal to this board that shows that you worked on those issues that would cause you to commit such a terrible crime. And I'd like to know why you have not been involved in that kind of programming. Okay. Um, I mean, the only really answer that I can have for that is, you know, I was at the state police barracks until 2013, 14, and there was nothing offered there. When I went to hunts and I became a Catholic peer minister, I didn't, I didn't participate in the thinking of change for a change. I kind of use that as an example. That's the type of programs that they were being offered there. And they were through the religious department and I was facilitating them. I didn't actually take them. I was kind of teaching them, but I, I guess I was a facilitator. And uh, when I came to, <clears throat> when I left there and I came to Angola and got involved in reentry, it wasn't too much later, the COVID thing came to, uh, you know, all over. And basically we were shut down here. I had been on the waiting list for thinking for a change for quite a while and victim awareness. And I'm still on the backlog for it. I just recently took anger management. But okay, let me ask you, says that why, why did you leave the state police barracks in 2013? Um, no other reason than I didn't get a write up or any time of disciplinary action. I just, uh, it was not a very good place for me for the reason there's not too much to do at the state police barracks. They're strictly work and uh, uh, a very limited hobby shop. Gus Mays, a I would say is a friend of mine who I used to work for was at that hunts and he needed an electrician. And so I asked to be sent back to DOC and I went to hunts and, and went to work for Gus at. Um, how I long, had, how long were you at the Barrett? Probably six, seven years. I don't know exactly. It's probably 2007 to 2013. I, I think that sounds right. <laughs>
So you've not done uh, victim awareness. You've not done thinking for change. Um, were you involved in the use of drugs or alcohol during the time that you committed this crime with alcohol a factor? No, ma'am, I never have. So you never had an issue with alcohol or drugs? Did you drink at all? Uh, I drank quite extensively in my younger years, but I was probably about 25 and I quit drinking. I, I, I think I was probably about 25 or 26. I quit drinking. I didn't. And I've never used drugs. I show that you have a, uh, a low risk assessment. You've had uh, 12 write-ups. Uh, the last one was in 2014. What was that for? Uh, unsanitary practices, which were um, <clears throat> what it revolved to is apparently my bed was unmade or I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I believe someone put some uh, reading material that I had given them on my bed. There was nothing specific on the write up. I might have left something out of shape underneath my bed, my shoes or something, but. Well, I'm looking at your disciplinary record right now. There is a specific write up number for unsanitary practices, but your write up is for rule five, which is an <clears throat> aggravated disobedience. So you wanna to talk to us about that? Yes, I sure will. Uh, I'd left the dorm that morning rather early, and I was told that the colonel made an announcement in the dorm that they were going to do a shakedown, or not a shakedown, but a inspection of our dormitory later that morning, so to get our bed areas in shape. And I was not in the dorm at the time, but I think 70 some people got write-ups that morning, and I was one of them. Uh, when I went to court, I explained the situation and he asked me to sign a paper that I was pleading guilty and that he would result in a reprimand. And I think that's what the outcome was. Uh, Warren, what can you tell us about Mr. Holt? So, there has been a, uh, in a Trustee, sorry, we're having to move our uh, camera around to, to meet our needs right now. Um, uh, Amin A since 2006, and as you stated, he's been to uh, the state police barracks and then to hunt for a while and then back to us since he's been back to us in 2015, uh, came back in as re-entry, went through some schooling and as well had been a, a lead and then also a mentor in the electric shop. Uh, he, for the last uh, couple of years, has been working in our TV repair shop. Uh, in the last several years of, of his incarceration here, we've not had any problems with him. Thank you, Warden. And Mr. Hall, again, um, I know you apologize um, for your actions, but tell us how you think your crime impacted uh, your ex-wife's family and other people. What impact do you think your crime has had? I can hardly imagine, the, you know, the the grief that I've caused them, especially Shirley and Julius. Uh, I know it had a terrible impact on my son as well. Um, I know that, you know, it's, it's probably hard to understand, but what happened was the last thing that I wanted to happen because I needed Ann in our situation with Gregory. I thought to take care of Gregory as much as I think or thought that she needed me to take care of the, the financial aspects of this. And uh, I apologize to the family before and uh, the victims, but words can't really ever compensate for taking action such as I did. 
Um, just since then, I've tried to do things that were positive and help others and uh, hope that by my actions and uh, my lack of any further disciplinary actions or problems through the years, you know, it's kind of showed that I've tried to be a better person and tried to change and be different than what I was then. And, and just, just to, I was about to wrap it up, but there was something that you said that kind of struck me. You, Ann was responsible for loving and taking care of that little boy who, through no fault of his own, had this terrible uh, disease. And you only saw yourself as the, the bill payer. I, I don't hear any personal attachment to that child. It seems as if you left that to Anne, and your concern was just how much it was costing. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. So how would you address that? Well, I mean, I'm sorry if, uh, if it sounds like that. I don't want it to be. Uh, I was involved with Gregory's life. I, you know, I had him every other weekend and, you know, we did what we could. It was kind of limited, but the New Orleans Zoo and different things that came up through the, through time. I, I did spend time with him. I was very involved in taking him to the hospital when he was required and physical therapy at Oshner's for, for uh, years and uh, you know I, I was a I was a busy person just like Ann was busy in her beauty shop and we didn't interact as much as we probably should have in that regard together but uh, I, I was always uh, if Ann ever needed me to do anything I was always there to to take care of it I guess thank you thank you for not for all right, thank you. Mr. Roche has a question. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Halls. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Nervous, but fine. Good. How would you answer this allegation? This is the allegation that was made that you broke into Anne's van in the middle of the night. You hid in the back of the van and waited for her to enter. Several coach we waited as long as 12 to 14 hours. We attempted to strangle her and put a zip tie around her neck. That was probably because of the link we took on her neck that Ms. Jackson was asking about. Then you shot her between the eyes. What would you say to that? Um, well, I think it was brought out in trial that, that she died from the gunshot wound. And um, sir, I, it's just, answer, I, sir, I, I answer, answer my question. What would your response to that allegation? It just wasn't, it's not true. That's all I asked. Okay. It was also a document that you were paying alimony to your wife and child support for your son. Am I correct? No, I did not pay alimony. I just paid child support. So you did pay child support. At the time of your ex wife's death, did you have any back child support? I don't believe so. It's been 30 years ago, but we just had a monitoring date about 90 days previous and it, you know, everything was up to date as far as I know. And my report, my report says that you were $11,000 behind in child support and business expenses. So well, probably that was medical expenses. You're kind of breaking up a little bit if you. Okay. Listen up, Mr. Holmes. There is some evidence in my report 
that you were behind $11,000 in child support and business expenses. What is your response to that? It, it's just not correct. I don't believe that. It, there may have been okay. some that outstanding, but it was nothing. I, I went to court pretty regularly. And believe me, if I got three months behind in my child support, which I did on several occasions, which is $1,200. That's the most that I know that it's ever been. We went to court and uh, I probably would have been in the Paris jail if, if it wouldn't have been paid, but it was always taken care of. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Roche. I have uh, just, just one question. Did you have a gambling problem? No, ma'am, I don't believe I did. I did gamble at the time. I had a, a poker game in my restaurant and bar at the time, but uh, you know, okay. I, I, don't, I don't believe it was a, a gambling That's all problem. I, there was just an indication somewhere in the report that you may have had a gambling problem. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So we'll hear from the folks that have joined us who indicated they'd like to speak. <laughs> Could we hear from um, Mr. Pritchford? Pitchford, excuse yes. me. So would you stand up? To the yes, I would just like to speak in support of Larry. I've known Larry for about 20 years in the prison ministry. During that time, I found him a faithful attendee, faithful to all the things that I asked him. And he was always instrumental in helping out. So that is my use. I would offer my support. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Ms. Uh, Julia Mai. Hi, uh, I am an attorney. I'm, I'm put together the packet that I hope made its way to you all. Um, and thank you for taking the time to consider Mr. Hull's application. Uh, I'm not, I'm not here as an attorney, I'm here as support um, because I'm licensed in Kentucky and I am scheduled to take the bar exam not until February. Um, so I did put the packet together for Mr. Hulls. And in speaking with him, I, you know, I think we have had some problems this morning with the connection. And I, I know that he's he's very nervous. Um, he has time and time again expressed remorse to myself um, about what happened about to, toward not just for what he did, but also in how that affected the family. And I do feel that that is genuine on his part. Um, you know, when somebody goes to prison for a lengthy sentence, such as a life sentence, they've got a lot of choices. And some people, and I'm sure some of them have been in front of this board, uh, they choose to not do anything. Uh, and that is something that you know, Mr. Holes has never done. He has never chosen to do nothing. What he did uh, as soon as he started, he started enrolling in programs. And I understand that perhaps there's not as as many programs uh, for various reasons um, as, as some might have, but he has a lot of, I think that the way that he addressed what was going on inside of him was through uh, a religious exploration and through his faith. Um, you know, it, he has a bachelor's degree, which was, took him four years. He also has an associate's degree, um, which in, in uh, from the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, which, you know, would normally take two years. And not just that, it, he stayed busy the entire time he was there. He's mentored others. And I understand you know, a lot of this is work, you know, he liked to stay busy, he liked to have work to do. And that's, you know, where his where his skills were. Um, but he's also mentored others, he's shown great empathy, uh, in his participation with the lookout program. Um, what struck me the most about what Mr. Hulls told me um, in discussing his journey was that he was able to through becoming an inmate minister, was able to minister to people who were mentally ill in the prison, people who were in solitary confinement, people who were in the, uh, the medical or mental health units. Um, and he's, you know, he described to me that, that that really was a turning point for him. He has been to church his whole life, um, but 
those things were things that really affected him. So the other choices that he made in, in addition to those sorts of things, um, you know, he could have gotten in a lot more trouble than he did. He, you know, even though he has a few write-ups, they're fairly minor write-ups, um, which I think that is obvious from the punishments or lack thereof that he received in exchange for those write-ups. Uh, he, you know, none of the, them were acts of violence in any, in any way. Um, he has so much family and community support, and I hope that my being here as a supporter isn't indicative to the board in any way that he doesn't have other people because we've had several people, you know, lined up who were willing to talk and many people who could have been here instead of me today. Um, but because of the situation, um, you know, you get me instead. <laughs> but we do have a number of letters. I think that there were 12 attached to the packet that I submitted. Uh, and it's my understanding as well that a number of letters were submitted directly to the board. Um, there's no way through words um, for him to express or to, for me to express on his behalf, you know, what the family must have gone through and still goes through. Um, and I know that he appreciates that aspect of it that he understands that that's something that he can't take back um as much as he may want to i think that he's got he's done so much in order to try to change what he can about himself and i know that some might try to do that in various ways and i think his you know was through faith and um so I think that by trying to show that, you know, he can be a productive member of society, that he can, he does have jobs uh, that he's capable of doing. Um, he's taught others how to do that. He's very intelligent, very capable. He's a person who can do so many things. Um, a person who's capable of, um, you know, ministering to others at this point. Um, and so I hope that the board will consider all of those things and all of the letters that were in support. I know that he has support there in, um, in the room in Baton Rouge today as well. And on behalf of all of us, then we would ask that the court consider his comment commutation today. Great. Thank you, ma'am. And we do have, I want to acknowledge that we do have the parole project here who uh, wish to speak, but we've run out of uh, spaces to uh, allow him to speak unless there's any particular questions that the board may have for the parole project. Mr. Gus May is here joining us by Zoom. Is there some remarks you'd like to make, Mr. May? I'm sorry, you're on mute. <clears throat> Can you hear there me? You. Now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, sir. I met Larry at Angola. He worked for me for quite some time in the refrigeration department. He came to the department knowing electrical, but he learned by himself the HVAC, and, and he trained himself through materials that I gave him and others made available to him, and he did a great job on it. Later on, when he left the barracks, uh, he came and worked for me at, uh, at Hunt Correctional. And unlike most people in the prison, I was not in security. I was uh, in, in maintenance. So the, the inmates that worked for me were much more like employees than they were inmates, so to speak. Uh, I did have an opportunity to meet a lot of inmates. Larry Hulls is one of two that I'm willing to speak for. And I knew him. He told me about his case. It was just like what you folks just revealed. Uh, he always presented himself as a fair and honest man. He was even tempered, uh, controlled. I think that living in prison is an exercise in self-control. Uh, generally among that population, there's people that can hurt you and you go to great lengths to uh, behave accordingly. But I think he has a lot to offer the community. Uh, I stated in my letter, he'd be welcome in my home at any time. And again, I think he's paid his price. I think that 
you folks would uh, be quite in the clear to give him his parole. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for, um, for your mm -hmm. remarks. We appreciate it. Thank you. I will hear the opposition uh, now, and it, uh, I'd like to state for the record, we do have a letter in the, um, in the record from Senator Bodie White expressing very strong opposition to a favorable recommendation. So could we hear from uh, Mr. Mark Hardy? Spent 30 years in prison. He wants to get out. He thinks he should get out. After 30 years, he thinks he's paying his debt to society. But my mom and dad, he had to spend a life without him. Gregory had to spend the rest of his life without him. Me and my sister. We have a lot of people in the family. We all have to go without the end. That's not a justice system. He can get out after 30 years, walk away. And we have to spend the rest of our life with him. Please tell me that you're not going to pay me back in. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, Mr. Brett Morrison. <clears throat> My name is Brett Morrison. I'm a nephew. Right. Mine is better to write down your emotionally attached to something. I'd like to lead off with a quote by Rose King. It has been said that time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain in time, the mind protecting the sanity covers them with scar tissue and the pain lessens, but it was never gone. This statement holds true for me and my family. I was six years old when my, when my aunt died. She was murdered by Larry Holtz. That was 30 years ago, almost to the day. Now here me and my family sit being asked to relive one of the most devastating moments in our lives. She was my favorite aunt. She was so full of light, love, and laughter all the time. But now, 30 years later, I can only recall one single memory of her. <clears throat> our family is forever fractured. My uncle can talk about it without getting choked up. My mom still to this day has nightmares. She goes to counseling to cope with grief. Imagine the fear and nightmares she'll have if you release this man from that. My kids, much like my other family members, will never know her. <clears throat> we can't watch old home movies or even tell old stories without a constant reminder that she was violently and selfishly taken from us. I read in core documents that she was killed over $11,000 in child support. What kind of person can kill the mother of a child, a special needs child, for eleven thousand dollars? <throat> In my opinion, there's no redemption or, or rehabilitation for someone who can so casually commit these crimes. My cousin never got to feel his mother's embrace again. My grandparents never got to hold the daughter again. <clears throat> my mom and my uncle never got to hear their sisters laugh at me. Instead, we were all sentenced to a lifetime of grief over losing a loved one 
in such a brutal manner. She wasn't terminally ill. She didn't die in some freak accident. She was intentionally and violently taken. In closing, I'd like to read you with one final quote. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. Blessed are the ones who know that they would be comforted. I ask that this will help comfort my still mourning family today by ensuring that Mr. Holes never gets released. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bowser from the DA's office. Yes, members of the board, um, on behalf of the district attorney's office for the 21st Judicial District, again, we would like to voice our opposition to uh, any grant of clemency or pardon for Mr. Holes. Um, this, again, was not my case. This one predates me by some years, but this was a case or a murder that happened over finances, over money. Um, in the financial care of a quadriplegic son and ultimately ended or resulted in that son being deprived of a primary caregiver. Based on the facts we've heard this morning, he then uh, he refused to help her by his own testimony here when she was begging for help after strangling her and then eventually shot her to death um, and then tried to cover it up, enlisting others to help him in um, disposing of her body, enlisting in others to try to uh, provide him with an alibi with this, and then leaves her to rot in an unmarked grave. Um, I would submit to uh, this panel that this was an attempt to make her disappear, which again has been the result of what he's been doing here uh, today. Again, you hear nothing about her in all of this. It's always about him, about what he's done, about what how to affect him. I find it interesting that the programs he mentioned that he has been doing in DOC, he describes them as self-help which is exactly what their purpose is. This is nothing but an attempt to help himself, checking off the appropriate boxes again to help himself. Um, I'm not hearing anything um, remorseful about what he has done, um, anything directed towards his ex-wife, towards the family, um, such that would try to make this up or give an explanation as to why it happened. Um, this was a heinous offense. Um, one that we state had to enlist the help of Mary Mannheim in order to help identify this, this body, uh, this victim. Um, and it is a heinous offense that has had lasting impact on this family, as you've heard today. Um, one that this defendant should not be allowed to just escape from. So again, on behalf of the district attorney's office, we are opposed to the grant of any kind of clemency or pardon for him. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so, Mr. Hulse, is there a statement you'd like to make before I turn it over to your attorney, Mr. Hamilton? Um, the only thing that I'd like to say is that, uh, you know, despite their feelings, I don't have nothing but uh, empathy for the family. And uh, in our relationship, as long as I knew them, they were, we were all cordial to one another. And I'm sorry that I had to put them through this. And I know, I understand how they feel. And I wish they would find some forgiveness for me uh, and mercy in their hearts. And that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. Um, board members, can you hear me okay? Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. I, I'm serving as an attorney for Mr. Halls. On behalf of him and his supporters, I urge you to grant his application and recommend a commutation of his sentence. I want to emphasize that he deeply regrets his crime for which he has spent 30 years trying to atone. He is completely rehabilitated and he would make a great contribution to society outside of prison if he is allowed to enjoy his freedom again. You didn't hear from um, Jay Jackson under whose supervision Mr. Halls has worked as a peer minister, but I think as Mr. Jackson would have told you, Mr. Halls has incorporated his religious teachings into his daily life. Mr. Halls has demonstrated his commitment to ministry and serving his church community while in prison. And this commitment is an example of his moral rehabilitation and his commitment to turning his life around. He's obtained his bachelor's and associate's degrees from the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, as you heard. You heard from Gus May, who is also one of Mr. Halls' super, 
supporters. Mr. May is the retired Department of Corrections facility maintenance manager who supervised Mr. Hulse for eight years. And he told you that the entire, as he put in his statement, he would, um, the, the entire time he supervised Mr. Hulse, he was an exemplary employee who was eager to learn, always got along with others, always volunteered for extra work, and never presented any disciplinary problems. Mr. Hull's employment while in prison demonstrates his work ethic and his general character. As you've heard, he's highly skilled as an electrician and in refrigeration. He has many marketable skills. He is a hardworking and, and he is a mentor to others. You also heard from my colleague, Mrs. Ju Ms. Julia Mudd, who explained the various positive choices Mr. Hulse has made since the tragic day when he took his ex-wife's life. She also discussed his faith journey, his work ministering to others incarcerated, other incarcerated men, his strong work history, and you heard from Mr. Halls himself. Other than the crime for which he is incarcerated, Mr. Halls has a clean criminal history. You know better than I do how unusual it is to have an applicant appear before you whose criminal history is so clean. If not for that single crime, I truly believe Mr. Halls' life would have turned out very differently because of his character. He's avoided trouble while in prison and he has had no disciplinary infractions for the past eight years. He has a low tiger score and the risk of recidivism, recidivism for him is entirely negligible. He's been an exemplary trustee for several years. He, he became a class A trustee, uh, I believe it was 16, 18 years ago. Um, as you can tell from the statements of support and the records submitted to you, Mr. Halls has garnered significant achievements while incarcerated. He's demonstrated exceptional leadership abilities, and he is a stellar example of moral rehabilitation taking place in prison. Those aren't just my words. Those are the words of assistant wardens who praised his service as a mentor in the reentry and rehabilitation programs at Angola, which you can find in the packet submitted on his behalf. The assistant warden for programs wrote letters of commendation extolling those character attributes three years in a row. I, I truly respect the difficult job you all have. You are in the redemption business. And you have the hard task of seeing past the worst aspects of a person's life and trying to discern whether they have the capacity for redemption and whether they are worthy of a chance to redeem themselves in the free world. I hope you will see that in Mr. Hulse, that he has the capacity for redemption. Mr. Mirabella said in an early, earlier presentation that you like to take into account who a person was, who they were, and what they've accomplished and who they are now. I think if you take that into account with Mr. Hulse, you see that he has turned his life around. I know that's a, a phrase you, you hear a lot. Uh, I've heard it a lot today, uh, repeated so often, it, it takes on the, the cadence of, uh, of cliche, but often the truth sounds like a cliche, and this is a man who has turned his life around. Judge Jackson, you, you said earlier that you, you like to measure rehabilitation by what a person has done for others. I think if you look at his record, you'll see that Mr. Hulls is really applied himself to helping others through his ministry. If Mr. Halls is allowed to leave prison, he will continue to be a model citizen and contribute positively to society. He has the full support of his family. I believe his mother and brother and sister have traveled to appear before you today. The parole project has accepted him as a client in its reentry program. And his brother who lives in Louisiana has agreed to support him with housing when he completes that program. We all have high hopes for what he will accomplish and achieve in the free world because he is remorseful, he's taken responsibility for his crime, and his achievements and character demonstrate that he would positively contribute to society if released. I again urge you to grant his application and recommend a commutation of sentence. Unless you have any uh, questions for me, that is all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I don't see any questions. The board prepared to vote. Mrs. Jackson will be voting first. <clears throat> Mr. Hobbs, um, prior to being on the board, I was a, a judge for 28 years. And so I've had a lot of experience talking to and listen, more importantly, listening to people uh, to discern who they really are. So I, I listen with my head and I listen with my heart. Uh, and hopefully with those two things coming into conversion, I get a pretty clear picture of the person before me. Uh, you have uh, 
on the surface done well in prison. Uh, it's not unusual for us to get inmates who've been in jail even longer than you, with even fewer write-ups than you. Uh, we have had inmates who have done phenomenally well while in the institution. We've had inmates who have served others exponentially more than they have tried to help themselves. Uh, when I, the first thing that struck me when I looked at your packet is it was heavy on vocational stuff, uh, electrical skills, HVAC, teaching those skills in the entry program, but really light on the kind of rehabilitative programs that get to the heart of who you are as a human being and being able to truly accept responsibility for the actions, to truly understand the, um, the impact that your farm has had on other people. And as I said, I didn't see a lot of, of those kinds of programs. I know you say you've done some faith-based things, and I don't count that, but that's not the same thing as doing the hard work of self-analysis. And I just don't think that you've done that. You know, some people will be good on the outside, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on the inside. And that's my perception of you today. You know, when I ask uh, the offenders to tell me what happened, it's not that I don't have all the information is right there before me. And I spent a lot of time combing through all the details. The reason I ask is to determine how honest a person is going to be. For me, that's a, that's a mark of rehabilitation. If you own up, you don't try to sugarcoat it, you don't try to minimize it, you own it. And you didn't do that today. You, you almost blamed uh, Ann because she attacked you. She was hitting you, and you just lost it. You glossed over Mr. Roche's question about what about the testimony that you hit out in her van for hours, waiting for her, lying in wait for her. You didn't own that either. And to me, that shows a level of um, really manipulative behavior on your part, not genuine remorse. And so for me, I just don't think you're there. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done and it's not in re-entry. It's not in being the prison electrician or working on air conditioning systems. It's on you. And, 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 and coming to terms with what you did. It, it, you know, when I think about that little boy, his mom was his loving caregiver, and you took that from him. You know, it, it, just, it just speaks volumes to me about the person that you were then, and I don't see a lot to change that today. So I'm going really to encourage you uh, to, to start working on you. Air conditioning and the electrical system will take care of itself. So work on you. But my vote today would be to deny your application because of a lack of rehabilitative programming, strong opposition from the victim's family and the district attorney's office, and the circumstances of the forum. So my vote today uh, is to do nine. That's um, just one vote, but I'm go up to you. Mr. Russell. Mr. Halls, I'm not going to repeat everything Ms. Jackson said, but I echo every word she said. 
you will got proof of today. You didn't take responsibility. And for the same reasons as Judge Jackson, I'm going to deny your request today. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Halls, uh, as Mr. Roche and Judge Jackson said, I'm not going to reiterate everything that happened today. Uh, and we do look at who you are today as opposed to who you are. But the crime itself, the nature of the crime, is always a factor that we consider. Sometimes we give more weight to it than other times. This is one of those times. Your crime, what you took away, and what, what you took away from your son, what you took away from your wife's family, uh, you don't seem to understand it. You don't seem to have accepted that. Uh, I, I don't think you were completely honest with us today. I don't think you're completely honest with yourself. And I think until you look inwardly and make those determinations, uh, I'm not prepared to vote to let you out. So my vote today, likewise, is to deny, primarily because you lack the empathy to understand the significance of what you did. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the halls, um, you know, I listen very, very intently, and you have done a terrific job while you've been in prison, and on the inside, you're doing a good job. But bottom line, and the first thing that jumped out at me is the same thing that jumped out at Ms. Jackson. I saw all kind of classes, you know, electrical and, and stuff like that, but I didn't see any programming for yourself, you know, victim awareness and, you know, things of that nature. I mean, I think you're headed in the right direction, and you may get there soon, but right now I just can't vote to let you out, uh, vote to deny out. All right, Mr. Hall, so you've received four votes to deny your application for clemency, so that is the outcome of today's proceedings. Your application has been denied, so good luck. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's unpack that, huh? The testimony. Let's unpack this. So, he's 65 years old today. He committed this crime in 1994, 30 years ago when he was 35. So this was no kid, this was a man, a full grown man. I had to do the research to really find out what happened, and I the link is down below. So, the facts. On Wednesday, October 21st, 1992, the defendant killed his ex-wife. Now, how they found it, now keep in mind, he didn't just kill her, and they found her body, but they found her body seven days later after he had hidden the body in two feet of sand somewhere in the desert. How they knew that he was a suspect is that they found a Tupperware container with urine in it in her van. And there was a fingerprint that matched him, which is the proof that if we needed any, that he did wait in the car between 12 and 14 hours for her to get in. He ambushed her. There were ligature marks found around her neck. The coroner simply said, because of the deterioration to the body, that he couldn't rule in or rule out whether she had been killed by asphyxiation but it was possible. She was found with the rope still tied around her neck and 
the bullet between her eyes. He had borrowed a gun from a friend three weeks prior. He was acting like it was a gun that he always carried on him. No, he borrowed it from a friend. That friend, when he asked for it back, he went and he bought a different gun and gave it to his friend. He denied his involvement for so long. He brought his employee and his girlfriend to help him with the alibi, which he then says in the speech, I'm sorry if they were just trying to do me a favor. Well, I could tell you your employee wasn't trying to do you a favor. She was probably terrified of you trying to keep her job. Not that's an excuse. He didn't get arrested until December 10th. So October 22nd, he murdered her. October 29th, they found her body. December 10th, they arrested him. This was not a crime of like... He it was this was so and you know they they initially tried to get him on uh, of course premeditated for some reason they dropped it to second degree I'm not entirely sure why but I guess they didn't care because it was the death penalty or life and they said life and he got life without the possibility of parole his defense that he took a trial was insanity temporary insanity. The man that we are looking at is really the worst of murderers. He's like the worst of our nightmares. His son, his poor little baby, six years old, fully there on a cognitive level, fully aware he has physical problems who relied entirely on his mother to do anything, to get dressed, to eat, to get out of bed, to get up the stairs, they needed to have a wheelchair lift. Because otherwise, how could this poor mother carry him? He was getting older, up and down the stairs. But that pissed him off, didn't it? That pissed him off that he would have to spend that kind of money on a wheelchair lift for his quadriplegic son. So he climbed into a van, waited there for 12 plus hours, even brought a container to pee in it, then strangled her and shot her between the eyes, took her out to the, de the desert and buried her. And then for seven days pretended he had nothing to do with it. Shame on you. You know, they created the, a bill which which has its in Louisiana, which allows people who have life sentences to to have the opportunity to meet in front of the board. The board will say, and this is why there are, there are, there are four plus one and five um, for these type of hearings, for these uh, life commutation hearings, where they would make it a 99-year sentence, which would make them immediately eligible for parole, and then the governor can then sign on it, approve it, if they get approved or deny it. Uh, I think this current governor is uh, denied under 30 that have been approved by the board. Um, and it's a good thing to have because there are cases where I believe people should not be locked up for life. Like if you're a dealer or if you got locked away for stealing because it was your sixth felony, yeah, they got life. But this case, to put the victims through it, I'm shocked that the parole board took on this case. Maybe you are too. Now, it's interesting that Carrie Myers didn't speak, and the board said that was because they had too many speakers. But I wonder if Carrie didn't speak because he didn't want to. And if there are things going on that were out of his control. 
for him getting approved by this parole board. Very rare to have two attorneys speak. <laughs> and I'll tell you, if they opted to not have Carrie speak, that was a big mistake because Miss Julia Mudd, that was one of the, that was on the lower spectrum of, of uh, representation. I took the notes on her. Some people choose not to do anything when they go to prison, but he didn't. That was one of the, the ways to pat him on the back, comparing him to people who choose not to do anything. And she says, I understand that the programs aren't, um, you know, like as others take. <laughs> um, she said that he mentors people in solitary confine confinement. No, I don't think people in solitary confinement are allowed to be mentored. That's the idea of solitary confinement. They're not around people. So someone correct me if I'm wrong, or again, is she just spewing? And then um, could have gotten in more trouble. She literally says that he could have gotten in more trouble. <laughs> oh, man. Um, he said, he actually said in this hearing, she tried slapping me. You know, I love it. Miss Jackson, Miss Jackson, Miss Jackson. I am so happy that she had this case because she really does relieve a lot of my stress and anger and anxiety from watching this uh, or frustration because she really did say it best. And everything I'm saying is just a way again to just like vent through the experience that we just saw together. And I also feel that I touched on a lot of things that you might be thinking. So it's it's therapeutic for all of us. Other things that really stuck out to me, he's like, this, you know, I don't have a gambling problem. He has poker games in his restaurant and bar every night, but he doesn't have a gambling problem, sure. They say in the report here that he was in debt maybe 30 plus thousand dollars. He had a he had a real financial problem. It seemed every time that questions were asked that he wasn't comfortable with answering, he would say, "You're breaking up. You're breaking up." And I know that the speaker phones are really bad. We all know that. But in this particular hearing, I didn't hear them breaking up. And he kept re re resorting to that. And that was just a, another sleazy move. And um, just, I, you know, is he a sociopath? I know we bring up that term quite a lot. But that's also because we see a lot of people on this channel that we can't understand there needs to be a logical reason as to how someone can be so brutal and so detached and so disgusting that at least saying okay they're a sociopath it just makes sense because they're really missing a part in their brain that allows them to have empathy towards others and at least we can put a you know find a logic around how that can exist where i get lost is how people support that that's where then it's like the next level it's like okay maybe he's a sociopath but why are the people supporting him okay well maybe his attorneys are getting paid so that's why but what what, the, what about the other people it's hard for me to talk about this without breaking down in tears but i have a six-year-old son We just turned seven and a five-year-old daughter. And to th there's a little boy, there's a little boy who can't get himself dressed or feed him. He has his mother that has been his protector there. His only source of comfort 
or his primary source of comfort. Thank God he had his grandparents that were able to take him. Thank God, thank God, thank God. But that little boy had to wait even seven days not knowing where his mommy was. And then he had to find out that his dad killed her. You know, some people create their own hell, some people go to hell, and some people are born in hell, and I just don't understand that. To be born as a quadriplegic and then to lose everything. I know there are more things that I want to say, but I, I, I'm now like, um, you know, the quote that was it his, his uncle that gave it, that was a good one. Time heals all wounds, but it, it doesn't lessen the pain. The pain's never gone. That man should never get out. That smug look on his face. He lied the entire time. Shamefully lied the entire time. Oh, I took her in the car to talk to her. Then she started to hit me. And then I, I don't know what happened, but I, I shot her between the eyes and I didn't know she was dead. I didn't know where I shot her and I was going to take her to the hospital. But he said that. No, you hid in her van. You sh probably strangled her to death. And then for extra whatever, you shot her between the eyes. And you were sober. You were dead sober. All you had was a financial problem and you thought it would go away if you killed her. You had no regard for your son. You had no regard for your wife. You had no regard for the family. You're a sicko. You're probably a psychopath. I hope you are because otherwise I just can't understand human nature. And I am so grateful for the board for seeing right through you. You don't even realize how pathetic you are. But shame on all of you who would support him. If you're an attorney, you're paid, I get it. But anyone who's not, shame on you. I'll let you go, please. Look forward to chatting with you in the comments.